Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 48, Mythopoeia. Good morning and welcome to Pints with Jack, a podcast where, normally, two enthusiastic C.S. Lewis amateurs get together, share a beverage, and discuss a work of C.S. Lewis. But today, I'm on my own, and we're drawing to the end of Season 3, So today I just wanted to share an episode of the Tolkien Road podcast. I was recently invited on to talk a little bit about Pints with Jack and then to discuss Mythopoeia, which is a poem written by J.R.R. Tolkien and dedicated to C.S. Lewis. Tolkien wrote this poem after their infamous discussion along Addison's Walk and their discussions in Lewis's rooms late into the night about the nature of myth and this really cleared away the remaining obstacles for Lewis's conversion from theism, belief in God, to full-blown Christianity. This episode is pretty much just going to be a reproduction of that episode, but I did want to precede it by a couple of things. I wanted to give a little bit more of an introduction, and I then wanted to read the poem, for those of you who haven't heard it before, and then just offer a few comments about it, because I think that will make more sense of some of the things that I say in the interview. So, a few comments about the poem before I read through it. It's called Mythopoeia, which literally means myth-making, and Tolkien wrote this while he was invigilating an exam, while he was supervising an exam, and he wrote it in response to the events of the night of the 19th of September, 1931. Tolkien and Dyson, two of the Inklings, they had dined with Lewis, and they had then taken a long walk around Addison's Walk in Magdalen College, and then they'd gone back to Lois's room and they talked late into the night. And the subject was all about myth. And the poem itself is actually addressed from Philomythos, or Philothemus, depending upon your pronunciation, to Misomythos, or Misothemus. Literally, it means from the myth lover to the myth hater. And he's addressing this to Lewis, one who said that myths were just lies breathed through silver. And throughout this poem, Tolkien attacks materialistic progress. And it's probably for that reason that the poem itself is written in heroic couplets, which was the preferred meter of the British Enlightenment poets. But I think that should be enough of an introduction. I'm just going to read through the poem and then offer a few more comments, and then I'll just play the interview. To one who said myths were lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver... Philothemus to Misothemus. You look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees, and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace one of the many minor globes of space. A star's a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical, amid the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are each moment slain. At bidding of a will to which we bend and must, but only dimly apprehend, great processes march on as time unrolls from dark beginnings to uncertain goals, and as on page o'erwritten without clue, with script and limning packed of various hue, an endless multitude of forms appear, some grim, some frail, some beautiful, some queer, each alien except as kin from one remote origo, gnat, man, stone, and sun. God made the petrous rocks, the arboreal trees, the Tellurian earth, and stellar stars, and these homuncular men who walk upon the ground with nerves that tingle, touched by light and sound. The movements of the sea, the wind in the boughs, green grass, the large slow oddity of cows, thunder and lightning, birds that wheel and cry, slime crawling up from mud to live and die. These each are duly registered and print the brain's contortions with a separate dint. Yet trees are not trees, until so named and seen and never were so named, till those had been whose speech involuted breath unfurled, faint echo and dim picture of the world, but neither record nor a photograph, being divination, judgment, and a laugh, response of those that felt a stir within by deep monition movements that were kin to life and death of trees, of beasts, of stars, free captives undermining shadowy bars, digging the foreknown from experience and panning the vein of spirit out of sense. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves, and looking backwards they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mind, and light and dark on secret looms entwined. 
He sees no stars, who does not see them first, of living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath an ancient song, whose very echo after music long has since pursued. There is no firmament, only a void, unless a jewel tent myth-woven and elf-patterned, and no earth, unless the mother's womb whence all have birth. The heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise, and still recalls him. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned, his world dominion by creative act. Not his to worship the great artifact, man, sub-creator, the refracted light through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues, and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world were filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods in their houses out of dark and light, and sowed the seed of dragons, t'was our right, used or misused. The right has not decayed, we make still by the law in which we're made. Yes, wish-fulfillment dreams we spin to cheat our timid hearts and ugly fact defeat. Whence came the wish? And whence the power to dream? Or some things fair and others ugly deem? All wishes are not idle, nor in vain fulfillment we devise. For pain is pain, not for itself to be desired, but ill. Or else to strive or to subdue the will alike were graceless. And of evil this alone is deadly certain. Evil is. Blessed are the timid hearts that evil hate that quail in its shadow, and yet shut the gate, that seek no parley, and in guarded room, though small and bait, upon a clumsy loom, weave tissues gilded by the far-off day, hoped and believed under shadow's sway. Blessed are the men of Noah's race that build their little arks, though frail and poorly filled, and steer through winds contrary towards a wraith, a rumour of a harbour guessed by faith. Blessed are the legend makers, with their rhyme of things not found within recorded time. It is not they that have forgot the night, or bid us flee to organize delight in lotus isles of economic bliss for swearing souls to gain a Circe kiss. And counterfeit at that, machine produced bogus seduction of the twice seduced. Such isles they saw afar, and ones more fair, and those that hear them yet may yet beware. They have seen death and ultimate defeat, yet they would not in despair retreat, but off to victory have turned the lyre and kindled hearts with legendary fire, illuminating now and dark hath been with light of suns as yet by no man seen. I would that I might with a minstrel sing and stir the unseen with a throbbing string. I would be with the mariners of the deep that cut their slender planks on mountains steep and voyage upon a vague and wandering quest, for some have passed beyond the fabled west. I would with the beleaguered fools be told that keep an inner fastness where their gold, impure and scanty, yet they loyally bring to mint in image blurred of distant king, or in fantastic banners weave the sheen heraldic emblems of a lord unseen. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient. Before them gapes the dark abyss, to which their progress tends if, by God's mercy, progress ever ends, and does not ceaselessly revolve the same unfruitful course with changing of a name. I will not treat your dusty path and flat, denoting this and that by this and that, your world immutable, wherein no part the little maker has with maker's art. I bow not yet before the iron crown, nor cast my own small golden scepter down. In paradise perchance the eye may stray from gazing upon everlasting day to see the day illumined and renew from mirrored truth the likeness of the true. Then looking on the blessed land, twill see that all is as it is and yet made free. Salvation changes not, nor yet destroys, garden nor gardener, children nor their toys, Evil it will not see, for evil lies not in God's picture, but in crooked eyes, not in the source, but in malicious choice, and not in sound, but in tuneless voice. In paradise they look no more awry, and though they make anew, they make no lie. Be sure they still will make, not being dead, and poets shall have flames upon their head, and harps whereupon their faultless fingers fall. There each shall choose for ever from the all.
So hopefully I didn't mess that up too badly. But just before I begin the interview, a few points about this poem. Uh, in the first stanza, Tolkien is making the point that you can't simply reduce the world to atoms. And he goes on in stanza two to say that the heavens declare the glory of God. Against the mechanical, naturalistic explanations of the world, Tolkien speaks about the unique nature of man and his ability to name and see beyond simple material things. And he begins to now hint at the importance of myth. And that's what he does in the next stanza, launching into a discussion of myth-making and arguing that myths give meaning. And he uses this analogy of light to speak about sub-creation, whereby God is pure light and man is like a prism. When the light passes through him, he refracts the light and he reveals some part of the spectrum, be it green, blue, red, whatever. And so God is the creator and man does something very similar because he's made in the image and likeness of a creator. That's what Tolkien called sub-creation. And here there are really strong allusions to the Silmarillion and the music of the Ainur, and also in Lord of the Rings. It's throughout Tolkien's work, the idea that God is the creator, and that's why we do the same thing. We sub-create. In stanza four, Tolkien, he responds to the Freudian thought that myths are just wish-fulfillment dreams. Uh, he also responds to this in his essay on fairy stories, which can be really paired with this poem. And in that essay, he says... Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner can't see it. And he goes on and says that wishing and the power to dream is a clue that we should examine. Where did this come from? Uh, think about Lewis in Mere Christianity in the chapter on hope, where he says, If I find within myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy... The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. It's a similar sort of idea. And in that stanza, Tolkien goes on to say that we distinguish between the beautiful and the ugly, the presence of good and evil. And once again, as people that read a lot of Lewis, you can't help but think of mere Christianity, where he talks about the problem that he had when he was an atheist. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man doesn't call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the, this universe to when I called it unjust? Anyway, moving on. In the next three stanzas, Tolkien gives us his own beatitudes. Blessed are the timid hearts that evil hate. Blessed are the men of Noah's race. Blessed are the legend makers. Tolkien blesses those whom the world dismisses those who believe in the face of evil and build their arcs and who aren't taken in by the world and its false promises of progress. Instead, he says, blessed are those, those people and, and blessed are those people who kindle in the hearts of others legendary fire. And in the next couple of stanzas, Tolkien says that he's going to stand with those people. He's going to stand with the minstrels and the ark builders who are going to take their gold that they've received and turn it into the banner for the Unseen King. In stanza 9, Tolkien says that he's not going to walk with your progressive apes. And this idea of myth of progress, this is something that Lewis also rails against throughout his writings. In The Abolition of Man, The Hideous Strength, Mere Christianity, Narnia, everywhere. Just because something's new doesn't make it necessarily better. Sometimes we need to go back and fix some mistakes. Tolkien says he's not going to walk down this modernist path into a world without whimsy, a world of meaningless, blind determinism. He says he's not going to bow before the Iron Crown, which is very reminiscent of Morgoth and the Silmarils. And he says he refuses to cast down his own small golden scepter, his dignity as someone made in the image and lights of God with a kingly calling to subcreate. And the final stanza of the poem reminds me very much of the book of Revelation. He speaks about paradise when everything is illuminated and we will no longer see through a mirror dimly. Our vision and our voices will be clear. Creativity will still continue and it will be renewed as at Pentecost. And the worldly chaos of Babel will be undone. So there you go. Thank you for indulging me. I am by no means a poetry expert. Um, but hopefully at least understanding how I read this poem will hope to make sense of the comments that I give in the episode which follows, which is with John and Greta from the Tolkien Road. 
Enjoy. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. On this episode of the Tolkien Road, we'll be talking with David Bates of the Pints with Jack podcast about C.S. Lewis, his friendship with Tolkien, and the poem Mythopoeia, which captures a pivotal moment in both of their lives. Thanks to our newest patrons, Eric S. and Joey S. Please support us on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash Tolkien Road to learn more. And now, without further ado, here's our conversation with David Bates. David, welcome to the show. It's wonderful to talk to you guys again. All right. Well, um, we're, we have David here today to talk to us about um, C.S. Lewis. And uh, David is the host of the Pints with Jack podcast. Um, as I've mentioned before on the Tolkien Road, C.S. Lewis was my first literary love. And he played a huge role in my becoming a Christian way back when I was a kid. I'm still mesmerized by his rhetorical power. I recently reread his essay collection, The Weight of Glory, and remembered the strange effect it had on my soul a a long time ago. He was able to evoke within me a spiritual vision of heavenly things, high-mindedness in the best sense, a deep sense of both hope and moral responsibility. It's rare that a writer can do both with such extraordinary power. And of course, Lewis and Tolkien were very close friends and had a very important relationship as fellow creatives, intellectual colleagues, Christian brethren, and drinking buddies. To that end, the figure of C.S. Lewis is critically important to consider when going further up and further in to the mind and works of Tolkien. So we were honored to join the C.S. Lewis podcast, Pints with Jack, a few months ago to discuss Tolkien and the Silmarillion. Definitely check out our episode on the Pints with Jack podcast and subscribe to their feed and dive into the rest of that show while you're at it. We had such a good time that we wanted to have David on the Tolkien Road to talk about C.S. Lewis and discuss Mythopoeia, the poem Tolkien wrote for C.S. Lewis. So uh, once again, David, welcome to the show. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for being here. Yeah, we're glad you could come. And, we're glad we could do this again and kind of turn the tables. So, <laughs> yes. And although that interview has gone out on your feed, it will be coming out on our feed on July 14th. So July. if you're if you're listening, mm-hmm. subscribe to us, expect them to hear you and not get confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think this one will... So today is what, the 11th as we record? So this one is going to come out on our feed on the 13th. So this is... Uh, it's kind of funny because we recorded that, that the 14th one first on the Pints with Jack, but this one might come out a day earlier. So uh, you're much... <laughs> you're much better prepared and ahead of your game than we are, than we tend to be. So uh, that, that's, that's why that all worked out. Yeah. So David, tell us about yourself. Well, as your listeners will be able to tell from my delightful accent, I am not from the United States. I was born and raised in England, although I started working for a U.S. company in 2008. Uh, they were a software engineering software company. And I've lived in Washington, D.C., Seattle, and San Diego. And by day, I'm a mild-mannered software engineer, and by night, I'm co-host of the CS Lewis podcast, Pints with Jack. Uh, right. And we, we named it Pints with Jack for two reasons. Firstly, Jack was Lewis's nickname from a very young age. Mm-hmm. And it's Pints because, well, who doesn't love a nice pint? Uh, but also, Lewis was very often to be found in the Eagle and Child pub in Oxford, talking about theology, philosophy, uh, uh, Christianity, as well as university politics. Yeah. Since Pints with Jack. Very gotcha. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the the Jack thing because I didn't I didn't necessarily think to ask about that specifically. Although <laughs> because I already I knew, <laughs> but I'm willing to bet a lot of people don't know that. Right? That don't know that's where that that name comes from. So it's um, thank you for clarifying that particular item. Well, I, in the days before COVID, I used to go around and give talks on scripture, church history, and often C.S. Lewis. And on my first C.S. Lewis talk, I didn't explain that. So at the question and answer at the end, somebody was very confused because they thought I was talking about two different people because occasionally I'll speak about C.S. Lewis and then sometimes about this Jack person. Oh, gosh. So funny. <laughs> well, funny. It's kind of it's kind of like um, how Tolkien was known as Ronald by so many people and but no one would think no one in the wider world would think to call him ronald right or yeah. any one of his other uh first name you know one of his other names he's tolkien to everybody uh or J.R.R. tolkien kind of like c.s lewis nobody really knows what the c.s stands for it's you know and and you know it, unless you've taken the time and you wouldn't definitely wouldn't know that was his nickname unless you've you know done your research beforehand so, well so how did you first discover lewis so I was introduced to the Chronicles of Narnia at a very young age yeah. by my mother and my sister. 
Uh, they were used as bribery to get me to stay in the bath because I was a little boy <laughs> and therefore not a fan of washing. Uh, and they were also used as a reward for me brushing my teeth, getting my pajamas on and getting into bed on time. So I had a very early exposure and then that was aided by, I think I must have been about eight at the time, the BBC started producing adaptations of the first few Chronicles of Narnia in all of their low budget glory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was a real Narnian fanatic and yeah. I actually have a picture of me with my big plastic toy lion who I never to be called Aslan mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a small child. So I was, I was definitely a huge Narnia fan early on, mm -hmm. but I don't really remember touching Narnia after about the age of 11 or 12. Okay. Um, okay. But then in my mid twenties, I had a big conversion of heart and I threw myself into the life of my local church mm -hmm. and my small group leaders, they were teaching a drug awareness course to other parents. I think it was for about a month or so. And so they asked me to look after their kids while well, they were, telling other people how to raise theirs. Uh, and so I was looking after four children immediately. The foreshadowing was there. <laughs> uh, later, they would actually add a fifth, who's my godson, Johnny. Oh, uh, awesome. But I had four children to look after. And I'm a guy in his early 20s, and I don't know quite how to do this. So I just did what my mother did. I used the Chronicles of Narnia as bribery. Mm -hmm. If they changed into their pajamas, if they brushed their teeth, if they were in bed on time, I would read them a chapter of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with voices because that is the only way <laughs> that reading should ever be done out loud. Amen. Can we Amen. get a, can we get a yes. uh, sample recording of that at some point? <laughs> <laughs> it is actually available. I, I had one of my friends who's a teacher. They were reading through The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, mm -hmm. and she transitioned into my recording uh, because it was more authentic oh, being with wow. an English accent, despite the fact that C.S. Lewis was actually Irish, but that's by the by. <laughs> <laughs> to, you know, to, to us in America, it's like it all, sound, it all sounds... I don't know if you've listened to the episodes where I give Greta a hard time about trying to do some non-American but English speaking oh, accent yes. and you know it's, anyway it's I a little, yeah. she, she's giving me the evil eye so I won't go there too much but. no it's true <laughs> well let me pick up my story and uh, divert attention uh, <laughs> thank <so> you <laughs> the babysitting came to an end but over the course of that month or so I it had really reinvigorated my love for Narnia so I then just went out bought the complete set and read them all in about a week and a half mm -hmm. and I, it was then that I found out that, oh, C.S. Lewis wrote other books other than the Chronicles of Narnia. So I got another set. I think it was Mere Christianity, The Problem of Pain, The Great Divorce, and The Screwtape Letters. Mm -hmm. And so then I started reading Lewis's other works, and that just carried on. It just continued. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. So how, how many years ago was that when you kind of dove into, um, the like, the, went deeper? That was probably about 15 years ago okay. when I started getting into Lewis's non-Narnian works. Yeah. So it's just been devouring it, since then. <laughs> well, sort of. It's yeah. sort of been devouring. Uh, a lot of people are surprised at some of the C.S. Lewis works I haven't read. And part of it is because I'm just trying to pace them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't just want to read all of them in a very compressed period of time. So, for example, this season on Pints with Jack, we've been reading through Till We Have Faces. Yeah. And I hadn't read that before. Yeah. And I purposefully mm. hadn't read it before for, well, for two reasons. One, so I could read it live, so to speak, on the show over the season. Uh, but also, several people have told me it was one of his harder books. And I was a little bit scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And reading slowly through some of Lewis's harder works, it, it really yields good fruit because you don't just rush through and just you're looking for a story. And right. I think that yeah. book in particular, that's why a lot of people are disappointed when they read Till We Have Faces because they're just expecting another Narnia. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different kind of book. Whereas mm -hmm. when you only get to read a chapter a week, you have to really sit and mull over it. Yes. Yeah. Well, so what what is it that you love about Lewis? Like, how would you... Um, that's like asking me what I love about Tolkien. I try to say a few words and then I just kind of start gushing and blubbering. Um, I'm sure you kind of feel the same way, but wh how, what would you say you really love about uh, Lewis? Well, obviously there is a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, first and foremost, the guy can write. Yes. And you wouldn't expect J.R.R. Tolkien to hang around with someone who didn't have a way with words. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. I think probably one of Lewis's great strengths is his versatility, particularly when it comes to different genres. He's written apologetics, fairy tales, science fiction, essays, autobiographies, poetry, anthologies. And that's even aside from his day job. 
which was uh, his academic his academic work of literary criticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I often joke, you might say he's a jack of all genres. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you for pretending. Yes, to no, that was good. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think just finally. Lewis is just very pithy, witty, and he's very quotable. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, because of that, a lot of quotes get attributed to him, which aren't actually him. And you see them shared a lot on the internet, and they are the bane of my existence. Well, but it's also good podcast fodder, right? You know? Oh, Did absolutely. he actually say this, right? You know? <laughs> and it also means whenever I'm in a bad mood, I just go onto Twitter, I go to the hashtag, hashtag search, type in C.S. Lewis, and then I can spend 10 minutes just going through everyone's posts saying, he didn't say that. He nice. didn't say that. Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, what's your favorite? Um, what's your favorite fiction work by Lewis? Oh, this this kind of isn't fair. It, it, it's sort of like asking a parent for their favorite child. You do have a correct answer. You know what the truth is, but you just feel bad for the ones that you leave out. <laughs> I tell my um, kids it depends on the day when they ask me who they're at. <laughs> and sometimes it depends on the, the hour or the minute of the day. <laughs> So yeah, it could yeah. be that, you know, Lewis's uh, collection is, is so wide. It could very well be the same for you. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes it kind of depends on how much work you want to do because some, mm-hmm. some books you can just uh, just wallow in like a warm bath and other yeah. ones mm-hmm. make you do a little bit more work. Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably my favorite fictional work of his is The Great Divorce. Uh, it's mm-hmm. basically his version of Dante's Divine Comedy yeah. where he visits hell, yeah. poetry, mm-hmm. and heaven. Mm-hmm. But this past season of doing Till We Have Faces, a retelling of the Cupid and Psyche myth, Mm -hmm. that has come very close, very close to displacing it. Wow. Uh, And uh, even then, at the same time, how can I just not say the Chronicles of Narnia? Right. (laughs) Because they were my first introduction. They have a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, And on that one in particular, when I've given talks on Lewis, almost always one of the questions is, I haven't read any of his stuff before. Where should I begin? Mm -hmm. And I will suggest to people the chronicles of narnia and sometimes they'll screw up their face at the mention of a children's book and i I really try and drive home the point that uh one this is incredible literature period Mm -hmm. and i'll I'll quote lewis himself he said that no book that's really worth reading at the age of 10 if if it's not worth reading then it's not worth reading at any time interesting Mm. yeah huh yeah Uh, i want to ask a quick question just related to the chronicles because i mean there's how many books there's seven 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 does that include magician's nephew or is magician's nephew Mm -hmm. it is okay so do you and this might not be a fair question either but would you say that you love all those books equally or there are a couple standouts and i'm only asking because i didn't make it through the whole series i I know I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's true. Um, but two, our old, our two oldest children have mm-hmm. read the entire series, and both of them have picked out one book specifically and said, "I really didn't like this one." So I'm wondering, kind of, your just opinion on the series as a whole. Yes, I definitely have my favorites, and it yeah. has changed. Okay. When I was a child, my favorite was *The Voyage of the Dawn Treader*. Hmm. Something about getting mm-hmm. into a boat and heading off into strange new worlds. Wonderful yes. stuff. Yeah. Yes. There's something in, in my heart that it really stirred. My least favorite as a child was The Horse and His Boy. And funnily enough, when I was in my mid-20s and I reread The Chronicles, The Horse and His Boy suddenly became my favorite. Oh, mm. wow. How funny. I think I didn't like it as a child because one of the main protagonists is a girl. And, <laughs> ugh, girls. Careful, David. Also, careful. And spoiler warning, at the end, they get married. <laughs> <laughs> Love and stuff. Ew. But what I loved as an adult was, I don't want to give too much away, but you don't really see Aslan for the majority of the book. Mm. It, it's, it's equivalent to the biblical book of Esther. God isn't oh. so much named. He's just there in the background the entire time. And there's something about that, that as an adult, as someone who had gone through peaks and troughs, mm-hmm. I, I really, really appreciated it. Mm-hmm. Now, the most common book I tend to find that people like least in the Chronicles of Narnia is Prince Caspian. Mm-hmm. Was that the same for your kids? No, our kids was actually Horse and His Boy. Uh, okay, yeah. so may- maybe it's the girl thing. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> they, they get married at the end. Um, yeah, it, that, a lot of people don't like Prince Caspian just because it, it doesn't stand out in the same way. So you have the Lion, mm-hmm. which the Wardrobe, which is people's first introduction to Narnia. It's mm-hmm. probably Lewis's most striking work ever. Yeah. 
Um, and a lot of people love the Voyage of the Untreader, the Silver mm-hmm. Chair, uh, and, and The Last Battle, which is the apocalypse of mm-hmm. Narnia, mm-hmm. is just all kinds of moving. And, you know, if you don't weep at the end of that book, you have no heart. Um, but, yeah, I think I think they might change their mind in 10 or 20 okay. years. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll share that with them. <laughs> Prince Caspian was the last one that I read, though. Prince Caspian was kind of, I, I didn't enjoy that and kind of quit but we did listen to a sound recording of voyage of the john treader yeah. last year on a road year, trip yeah. and oh man it was fantastic yeah it was yeah. so good yeah. maybe we need to listen to have you all done prince caspian have you all talked about prince caspian on the podcast yes so what we do is each season we'll be reading one of lois's books non-narnian books mm-hmm. and then at the end of the season we'll have one or two or even sometimes a few more episodes on the one of the chronicles of narnia and we're reading them in publication order so we've done Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We did Prince Caspian. And this season, we just wrapped up with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And so we read the book, and then we got together with the guys from The Lamp Post Listener and just ragged on the terrible movie adaptation that's produced. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> oh, man. Well, maybe we need to, uh, maybe we need to retry Prince Caspian and have, um, have, have a little Pints with Jack commentary on it to uh, increase our appreciation. I... That sounds great. I think that's what we that need to do. That sounds great, yeah. Uh, Greta, Greta yes. I'll, I'll say something else. When we've read both, it, I don't think it's so much the case with Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, but both Prince Caspian and Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Matt hasn't read any of them. Oh. And when he read them and then came to them, he said, I oh, you know, some things I quite liked, but uh, it wasn't really me. At the end of our discussion, he said that he liked them more as a result mm, of our discussion. Of the discussion. So, yes. Yes, it's, it's like as as with most most things. When you talk about it a little mm-hmm. bit more and tease out, you actually you you, mm-hmm. you start appreciating stuff that you, you did like, but you it, it's uh, just an opportunity to to see the cleverness that is at work. And right, right. the Chronicles of Narnia, we'll probably mention it a little bit later when we talk about Mythopoeia. But uh, Doctor Michael Ward, he's put forward a hypothesis that Lewis was modeling the Seven Chronicles of Narnia on the Seven Heavens of the Medieval Cosmos. Interesting. Meaning that hmm. each book is modeled after one of the planets. Yeah. Uh, he includes the sun in that, but after each one of the planets of the Seven Heavens of the Medieval Cosmos, which means wow. that there is themes and imagery in each book wow. that you actually don't even notice while yeah. they're there, as he's trying to draw out these, uh, for example, in Prince Caspian, it's all martial imagery. It's all, it's all about Mars, Mars. which yeah. means uh, God, who God, who's also God of the trees and of war. And so those images are layered throughout, even so small as when they come to uh, Care Paravel and they find a chess piece, what do they find? But a knight, mm. who is the main character that everybody loves in Prince Caspian, but Reaper Cheap, who is yeah. this martial mm-hmm. figure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Wow. That is fascinating. I think wow. That- Oh, I, so you'll have you'll have actually discussed that theory on the on the podcast uh, not in too much depth, depth. i went okay. on the talking i went on the talking beast podcast and uh-huh. uh spoke about it with glum puddle there uh and i did a short episode just explaining the theory uh for just to encourage people to read the book yeah because mm-hmm. i i think as with as with most authors but i think it's 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 most true of lewis each of his books helps inform all of the other books so when you read the discarded image and you read his description of the planets and about, uh, that these are spiritual symbols of lasting value, and then you come to Narnia and you see how he starts playing these out, it enriches your reading. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the same thing that we're going to talk about with Mythopoeia. When I'm reading through that, I see traces of thoughts that are going to come out in his works, mm. you know, 10, 20 years time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. Well, so what is your favorite nonfiction work by Lewis since <laughs> with the understanding this is an incredibly difficult question can, <laughs> back against the wall what would you pick <laughs> or Desert well, my Island <laughs> fir- my first introduction was Mere Christianity mm-hmm. which is a fun and very winsome introduction to Christianity but it's also a book that I, I read it almost like an examination of conscience because in mm. many places he's dealing with some of the hardest parts of Christianity and it's actually not even things like the Trinity. It's on the ideas of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So in the chapter on forgiveness, Lewis says that everyone thinks that forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Yeah. yeah. And he says then to mention it at all, it's to be greeted with howls of anger. Yeah. Mm. And so even though it is meant to be an introduction to Christianity, I, I often use it like a devotional book. Yeah. Um, 
So that was my first introduction. I think probably my other honorable mention would be The Four Loves, mm -hmm. which is a discussion of the different kinds of love. Because in English, we just have one word, love. You know, I love my wife. I love hot dogs. Uh, I love my car. These, right. All of these <laughs> things are very different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But Lewis, he, he, he uses four different Greek words and ascribes meaning to each of them to try and talk about different kinds of love. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the, the love of pets, the love of country. And then he's specifically focusing on the love of family. So between parents and children and siblings, the love of friendship, uh, romantic love, and then finally divine love. And he then makes this point, which after you've read it, you then start seeing it in all of his other books everywhere. And it's the idea that when we make our natural loves, love of family, friends, romance, when we love those things often disproportionately and in a disordered way. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, those lesser loves, when we make them gods, they become demons. Mm. And you then suddenly see this idea yeah. shot through in all of his works. Yeah, this just brings back to me, like, I, you know, um, I, I, I mean, I've read a good, a good bit of his stuff over the years. Um, and, and like I said, in the introduction, reading the weight of glory last year for me, after it had been years since I'd really, you know, been deep into anything, into C.S. Lewis, um, it just reminded me like why I was so captivated by him in the first place, you know, just so much, uh, just such, just such incredible insight, but it's always a, um, it's always a very like consoling and challenging insight, you know, it consoling and challenging like it it makes you want to be better but it but at the same time it, it just it fills it fills you with hope at the same time too and it, and it's so it's it has this just remarkable spiritual power like so, so so many of so many of his works have this remarkable spiritual power you know you mentioned the great divorce is your is a fiction work reminded me of i i really i've been saying for years i need to go back and read that again because it's been years and i was not catholic when i read it as a as a uh, teenager so I I think I'd have a much more deeper appreciation for it now mm -hmm. than I mm -hmm. than I would have. We um, have a copy of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. and it's just talking to David is reminding me. I know it's yeah. good. I'd never read. It. I read it last year for my book club, and mm -hmm. um, I I'd never read it before, but it's it's the top of my list now too. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's fascinating. Just in that book, he presents so very clearly that we are morally insane. I know. It's, yeah. Yes. But, but yes. we have heaven presented to us and we choose to turn mm -hmm. our back because we don't want to get rid of our hellish mm -hmm. souvenirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very convicting. Well, like and, and, very, very convicting. And, and the time we're living through now is a, there's just so much anger and vitriol and um, unforgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Out there. Um it's stark. I don't know that I've ever felt that sense in, uh, you know, uh, in, in my lifetime of just how ugly it all feels out there and, and on a lot of levels. And, um, so that reminder of the power of forgiveness and how hard it actually is, right. Mm -hmm. Um, is a, is a reminder for our time. It's a time, it's a, it's a truly a timeless reminder, you know, and this is a guy who of course lived through two world wars when, you know, things were, were very, um, ugly out there and that uh, was one of his great strengths mm -hmm. if if something is not eternal it is eternally out of date but, and that's one of the reasons why his writings just last mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. S speaking of uh s speaking of very uh, good quotes uh, what's your favorite quote <laughs> from a man who <laughs> has probably hundreds of, of great quotes Yes, uh, I actually try and do several on our Instagram feed each week. Mm -hmm. Pints, would you like? Uh, I'm just trying to drown out all of the incorrect quotations just by yeah. showing there's <laughs> so many more legitimate ones that are fantastic. So I always provide citations. Um, you mentioned the weight of glory, and you you said in advance that you'd want me to uh, give a couple of my favorite quotations. So I. I pulled out one from The Weight of Glory. Awesome. Lewis says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on playing, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. Mm. We are far too easily pleased. Boom. Woo. Yeah, that's such a good one. I I I remember reading that for the first time uh years ago and just you know, your 
your mind is just kind of like, whoa, like this is, <laughs> this man is so profound and wise. Um, and, and, and this is from his sermons and his, right. his essays as well. These aren't even mm-hmm. his main books. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, Pints for Jack is going to carry. I literally have mapped out the next 15 seasons <laughs> and we're still not even close to the end. Wow. I mean, one of the other, my, the other contender that I was going to suggest was from On Stories. Mm-hmm. And Lewis, when he's explaining why we tell stories, and he says, since it's so likely that children will meet cruel enemies, let them at least have heard of brave knights and heroic courage. Mm. Mm. Awesome. That gives me chills. Um, I remember, uh, we, and we need to move on, because we, we still have a lot to talk about, but uh, one final <laughs> thought, um, because you mentioned On Stories, and of course, Tolkien has on fairy stories, Mm -hmm. but I remember several years ago reading an experiment in criticism by C.S. Lewis, and you'd think that there would be like this, oh, this must be a real like academic snore fest, you know? I remember reading that and being like, this is just as awesome as all the other things I've ever read by. There's so much like, like even his, even his more academic like criticism had this same sort of power to it. I mean, it truly is. It's, it's, it's some kind of, divine gift that that he was granted you know and I, actually there's a book that's just come out by joe root and mark neal uh, i think it's called the forgotten lewis something like that mm-hmm. and they're basically going through his lesser known works that people often mm-hmm. don't read yeah. so someone that would say that they're a c.s lewis fan has probably read mere christianity problem of pain chronicles of narnia but they right. might not have read the discarded image and experiment in criticism or any of his poetry mm-hmm. hmm. man so much, so much good stuff. I feel like oh, I need no. to just devote a year to C.S. Lewis. So or more, <laughs> maybe a little more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so g- give us a kind of a brief, you know, a, a brief uh, history of how Pints with Jack got started. Well, I think it was back in 2017. Mm-hmm. I had been saying for a while that I wanted to start a C.S. Lewis reading group. Mm-hmm. I'd been enjoying R- Lewis's books, and but I just wanted to talk about them more. And then one day I was at a party in San Diego and I met Matt and the subject of C.S. Lewis came up as it always does at parties, as you know, Sure. (laughs) Uh, and I discovered that Matt was also a huge C.S. Lewis fan. And so we decided that even if it was just the two of us, uh, we now had enough for a discussion group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it was the two of us with a cup of coffee or a pint, we, we had our discussion group. And I just put up a message on Facebook saying when we were meeting the name of the coffee shop which chapters of mere Christianity we were going to be discussing. And people just started showing up, which was a delightful surprise. However, then two things happened. One, at the end of the meetings, Matt and I would talk, and we always feel like we had so much more to say. You know, we had to discuss six chapters there. I wanted like an hour on each. Mm. And also we had messages from people outside of San Diego asking us if they could Skype in so Mm. they could join in the conversation. And that was going to be a logistical nightmare. So in the end, we decided that we were going to solve both of these issues by starting a podcast because it would allow people from other parts of the country and the world to join in the virtual discussion. And it would also give us more time to dig into the works a little bit more deeply. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we started a podcast. We initially, we originally named it The Eagle and Child after Mm -hmm. the Oxford pub. Uh, and uh, that's where Lewis and the Inklings would meet on Tuesday mornings for mm-hmm. a more informal uh, chit chat. And that's actually why our podcast comes out on Tuesday mornings because that's when Lewis goes oh, to nice. the Oh, I love that. Cool. But when we decided to uh, put more time and effort into the podcast, when we when we had tested ourselves and found that we were enjoying this and we wanted to invest more time and energy into it, we went looking for a domain name and we couldn't find a good one that made use of the Eagle and Child. So we decided to make use of the handle that I had chosen for Twitter, which was just called Pints with Jack. Ah. Hmm. And so that's when the name changed. And uh, three years later, we're still going strong. Uh, and uh, we just repeatedly emphasize that we are not experts. We are amateurs. Yeah. And that's good because the word amateur, I'm sure Tolkien would uh, point out, comes from the French and the Italian, meaning the one who loves. Mm, And so we just, we love Lewis and we want to talk about his works and share them with others and learn as we go. Because as you no doubt know, when you do a podcast about a subject that you think you know something about, you realize how little you do know and you do learn a lot along the way. Yeah, well, true that's that. that yeah. is a uh, that is something I did not know that that what the true meaning of the word amateur is, and 
but like that makes total sense. Like that's exactly, I guess, how I describe myself uh, with it when it comes to Tolkien, right? I'm just someone who loves Tolkien. I, I certainly do not consider myself an expert, but someone who just wants to continually learn more and more. And um, so, and maybe the world would be a better place if there were more true amateurs, right? <laughs> instead of, I, instead I of so many people who fancy be. themselves experts. So oh, yeah. um, are we ever really an true. expert in anything? Um, okay. So uh, tell us briefly about the journey you've been on pints on for pints with Jack and what works have you covered and um, what's next? So we began in true professional style by the two of us in my room, balancing cheap microphones on an ironing board. Uh, <laughs> I, I was living with my friends at that's, the time. That's slightly they better had... in our beginning, definitely. So <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, to, to compound things, I was also living with my friends at the time, and they had two dogs and uh, a small child. Mm -hmm. So that really honed my editing skills, you know, being able to get rid of the screams and the barks. And uh, yeah, over the three years, we generally post once a week, like I said, on Tuesday mornings, because that's when the Inklings met. And during COVID, we've increased the number of posts just because everyone's home, you know, sure. we're just giving them something else to listen to. And so then we, uh, we then uh, published those on Thursdays, which was the night when the Inklings would gather in Lewis's rooms in Magdalen and then really get stuck into the texts. Ah. And oh. we group our episodes into seasons mm -hmm. and over each season we work through that book in small chunks usually a chapter sometimes two chapters at a time and we've gone through mere christianity the great divorce and till we have faces and as i mentioned before each season we will tackle another one of the chronicles of narnia and so we are now drawing to the end of season three uh i'm getting married in two weeks Yay. <laughs> so we're taking a few weeks off and then mm -hmm. we'll be back again doing the screw tape letters and at the end of that season we'll be doing the silver chair wow nice and we'll then also occasionally have guests on like yourselves mm -hmm. uh particularly during tolkien month and we'll have other authors and illustrators we had lena maslow she produces beautiful book on uh, the life of c.s lewis for children mm. And uh, I, I was interviewing Joseph Leconte, who was the author of uh, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War. Mm. So I was interviewing him last night. I think it'll come out just after your interview. And um, his book is currently being turned into a documentary. Uh, oh, wow. Hopefully be out next year. Yeah. Very interesting. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so for someone who knows nothing about C.S. Lewis, why should they care? So if you're, you, you're kind of with somebody meeting them for the first time, they don't know anything about you or your, or they know you, but maybe not about your podcast. You tell me you're doing a CS Lewis podcast, like tell, what would you tell them why they need to care about CS Lewis? Well, first of all, I question whether we should be friends at all. If they <laughs> right? haven't listened yes. to my podcast and don't love CS Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, no. <laughs> why read CS Lewis? Um, aside from being one of the greatest authors of the 20th century, mm. <laughs> Um, I mean, for your listeners, I would say that if you love someone, you automatically care about their friends. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you love Tolkien. Mm -hmm. And if you love Tolkien, you should care about one of his greatest, closest friends. Mm -hmm. and, and even further than that, if for no other reason than you should care about Lewis, you have Lewis to thank for the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. Because he was, for the longest time, Tolkien's only fan. Yeah, You know, the, mm. the two of them began deepening their friendship when Tolkien gave Lewis an early draft of Baron and Luthien. Mm -hmm. And over time, that thing evolved uh, into the Inklings. Uh, but the, also, just their personal relationship. And I particularly remember reading about when Tolkien was writing Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. The New Hobbit. He got a certain amount of the way through, and he just got stuck. Yes. He just didn't know. He said, I'm just getting bored. I don't know what to do. And it was Lewis who helped him out, saying that the thing that make that makes the hobbits so great is when they're put in non-hobbit-like environments. And what he had written in The New Hobbit up until that point was where they encounter this rider along the road, but it's a white rider, it's Gandalf. Mm. And that was when Tolkien then changed it to this dark rider. And he suddenly, he, he said then the story just started writing itself. Oh, oh wow. I didn't know that. That's and, cool. And Lewis was, and, and Tolkien was very vocal about his debt to Lewis. He he wrote to the the Tolkien Society of America. He says, "I have this unpayable debt to Lewis," mm. uh, and he said, "For a long time, he was he was my only audience." And he said, "If it wasn't for him, the Lord of Rings." Yeah. <laughs> and he said, "If it wasn't for him, the Lord of the Rings just 
wouldn't exist. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It, I mean, truly, what an incredible friendship, right? That these two, you know, mm. titans of 20th century um, literature, 20th century thought were such close friends and had such a huge impact on one another. Um, it, it reminds me, your your reflection there reminds me of a, of a Lewis quote, actually. And I, I don't, I'm not going to have it uh, perfectly, but it's when he was talking about <laughs> the the role that friendship plays in making a person who they are. And when, a, mm-hmm. when a, and, and he's, I think, it, I think it was after someone, was it Charles Williams had died or? Um, Quite likely that moved him greatly. Yeah. And, uh, and Lewis reflected and said like, we're no longer who I, I'm no longer who I was right before mm-hmm. when, when Charles was here. Right. And, and, and he kind of reflects on the role that Tolkien plays in his life and the role he plays in Tolkien's life. And, you know, the role that they played in Charles life and Charles played in their lives. And, and it's just a very beautiful. I don't know if you have it at hand or if it's one of those you have memorized, but uh, it, he, he it's talks a, about. Go he ahead. talks about it. In, he talks about it in his letters, uh, but in his works, he specifically talks about it in the Four Loves, mm-hmm. uh, when he says that romance is one to one. Lovers look at each other, but friends are side by side. They're looking at mm-hmm. a common thing, and he says that friendship invites more people because different friends bring out different aspects of each other Mm -hmm. and there he says that uh now that charles is gone you know my my understanding of of ronald is has Mm -hmm. also changed Mm -hmm. because he could draw something out of him that i can't yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow uh that if 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 that quote uh listeners doesn't give you (laughs) that idea doesn't give you you know enough reason to seek out lewis right there um and learn more about lewis as a tolkien fan then Mm -hmm. um I, you know, I guess you're pretty much hopeless. Yeah. So. <laughs> hopeless was the word that popped into my brain too. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. So, um, just, and we're about to dive into Mythopoeia, but I wanted to ask one last question on uh, just general C.S. Lewis things. What are some of the exciting things happening in C.S. Lewis fandom right now? So it, it, as you know, like with Tolkien, we're all way like, oh my gosh, we're going to do this big TV show on the second age and everything coming soon. <laughs> right. Um, what's going on in the world of, of being a C.S. Lewis fan? right now well i think it's other than say, the greatness of the pints with jack podcast obviously oh thank you oh no that was that was gonna be my answer i'm done <laughs> right <laughs> well i think it's fair to say that lewis is more popular today than he was even when he was alive wow and his works are becoming increasingly available as well as aids to help understand him you know you have annot- annotated editions coming out i mentioned the jerry root mark neil book ah and it was it was the neglected c.s lewis mm, that's for okay. his works that people don't often read but are mm. nevertheless fantastic uh i think the other thing that's really wonderful about the c.s lewis fandom at the moment and i think this is probably true for the tolkien fandom as well is that the new generation of fans is a lovely mix of scholars and amateurs mm-hmm. podcasts proliferate in the c.s lewis world we've got talking beasts focuses on narnia all about jack which is everything happening in the C.S. Lewis world, whether it's academia or popular works, The Lamppost Listener, Further Up, Further In, Going Through the Chronicles of Narnia, Brian McGreevy's podcast where he's going through the Screwtape Letters. There's just a lot of activity, mm-hmm. and it's really quite delightful. At the end of last year, we went to a C.S. Lewis symposium, and we got to meet a lot of the people who do podcasts and who've given mm-hmm. talks. And lots of wonderful friendships have come out of that mm-hmm. and collaborations. So in this season, after we had read The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, we got together with the Lamp Post listener guys and we did a crossover on uh, on their podcast. So we did a two-parter. So first part was on ours, second part was on theirs. And so I think there's just this wonderful creativity and it's this, this dynamism, uh, this creative community is what the Inklings were about. Mm-hmm. It's about smart people that care about the same sorts of things, and mm-hmm. not smart people. <laughs> uh, get together and talk and wonderful creations come out of it yeah uh, and there's a really great book by diana glyer called bandersnatch where she looks at how the tolkien lewis friendship generated all this wonderful work and was also the the dynamic heart this dyad at the center of the inklings mm. that uh, and, and this tide that raised all boats mm-hmm. and Probably the last thing that's great in the fandom at the moment is the nervousness and the anticipation of what Netflix are going to do with the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> so is that it's, so? It, so that's a thing that's hap- happening. I thought there was something going on with the Chronicles of Narnia as far as bringing them back to the screen. 
It's very similar to Latron Prime <laughs> in so far as uh, we have very scant details at the moment. Mm-hmm. There was actually an interview with Douglas Gresham, who is C.S. Lewis's stepson, wow. who yeah. sold the rights to Netflix, yeah. mm. and he said he's heard virtually nothing Ooh. from them since it happened. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Now, they're not going to sit on this forever, so it's just making... It's just it's it's now now is the time for wild speculation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun. That's, that's fun in and of it uh, in and of itself. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, um, let's talk about Mythopoeia. So, okay. so we on the Tolkien Road originally covered Mythopoeia way back in 2015 on episode 14. Though its genesis predates The Hobbit, it was not actually published until 1988 in a new edition of the book Tree and Leaf. The title Mythopoeia means myth-making, and the work is a poem dealing with Tolkien's ideas of subcreation and the spiritual role it plays in our lives. So what what I wanted to do here was provide a different sort of context and and give David, as a C.S. Lewis amateur... uh, Thank you. (laughs) C.S. Lewis amateur, a a chance to read Mythopoeia, I believe for the first time, and offer his own thoughts on this poem, because... uh, I didn't fit this quite in there quite yet, but Mythopoeia was written by Tolkien for C.S. Lewis. It reflects a very important conversation that he had with C.S. Lewis in uh, in, in the early 30s. Um, there's actually a more precise date. But before we dive right into it, I wanted I wanted to read actually a section from Tolkien's biography that I think gives a um, the, and this is the um, Humphrey Carpenter biography on Tolkien. And I think it gives a good background. It it may be a little, little bit on the long side, maybe for um, just listening to me blabber on. But I think it's helpful for setting the stage on this thing. It's actually from the chapter. Your, your called, listeners are Tol- your listeners are Tolkien fans. They're yeah. okay with things being long. <laughs> Get over it. That's right. Um, <laughs> so um, this is actually from the chapter called Jack. So uh, now you know. Now you know, Tolkien reader of this biography, why this chapter is called Jack. All right. And surprised by joy, Lewis wrote that friendship with Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices. At my first coming into the world, I had been implicitly warned never to trust a papist. And at my first coming into the English faculty, explicitly, never to trust a philologist. Tolkien was both. Soon after the second prejudice had been overcome, the friendship moved into the area of the first. Lewis, the son of a Belfast solicitor, had been brought up as an Ulster Protestant. During adolescence, he had professed agnosticism, or rather he had discovered that for him the greatest delight was to be found not in Christianity but in pagan mythologies. Yet already he had needed a, he had receded a little from that from this standpoint. During the middle 1920s, after taking a first class in the English school, and earlier a double first class in classics, and while making a precarious living as a tutor, he had arrived at what he called his new look, the belief that the Christian myth conveys as much truth as most men can comprehend. By 1926, he had moved further and had come to the conclusion that, in effect, his search for the source of what he called joy was a search for God. Soon it became apparent to him that he must accept or reject God. At this juncture, he became friends with Tolkien. In Tolkien, he found a person of wit and intellectual verve who was nevertheless a devout Christian. During the early years of their friendship, there were many hours when Tolkien would lounge in one of Lewis's plain armchairs in the center of the big sitting room in Magdalen New Buildings, while Lewis, his heavy fist grasping the bowl of his pipe and his eyebrows raised behind a cloud of smoke, would pace up and down, talking or listening, suddenly swinging round and exclaiming, Distinguo, Tollers! Distinguo! As the, other, as the other man, similarly wreathed in pipe smoke, made too sweeping an assertion. Lewis argued, but more and more in the matter of belief, he was coming to admit that Tolkien was right. By the summer of 1929, he had come to profess theism, a simple faith in God, but he was not yet a Christian. Usually his discussions with Tolkien took place on Monday mornings, when they would talk for an hour or two and then conclude with beer at the Eastgate, a nearby pub. But on Saturday, 19 September 1931, they met in the evening. Lewis had invited Tolkien to dine at Magdalen, and he had another guest, Hugo Dyson, whom Tolkien had first known at Exeter College in 1919. Dyson was now lecturer in English literature at Reading University. Did I say that right, Reading? Yes. Yep. And he paid. Although I will point out, it's Magdalen. It's spelt Magdalen, but it's pronounced Magdalen College. Magdalen. Okay. And he paid frequent visits to Oxford. He was a Christian and a man of feline wit. 
After dinner, Lewis, Tolkien, and Dyson went out for air. It was a blustery night, but they strolled along Addison's walk, discussing the purpose of myth. Lewis, though now a believer in God, could not yet understand the function of Christ in Christianity, could not perceive the meaning of the crucifixion and resurrection. He declared that he had to understand the purpose of these events. As he later expressed it in a letter to a friend, how the life and death of some of someone else, whoever he was, 2,000 years ago, could help us here and now, except insofar as his example could, could help us. As the night wore on, Tolkien and Dyson showed him that he was here mere here making a totally unnecessary demand. When he encountered the idea of sacrifice in the mythology of a pagan religion, he admired it and was moved by it. Indeed, the idea of the dying and reviving deity had always touched his imagination, his imagination since he had read the story of the Norse god Baldr. But from the Gospels, they said, he was requiring something more, a clear meaning behind the myth. Could he not transfer his comparatively unquestioning appreciation of sacrifice from the myth to the true story? But, said Lewis, Myths are lies, even though lies breathed through silver. No, said Tolkien, they are not. And indicating the great trees of Maudlin Grove, as their branches bent in the wind, he struck out a different line of argument. You call a tree a tree, he said, and you think nothing more of the word. But it was not a tree until someone gave it that name. You call a star a star and say it is just a ball of matter moving on a mathematical course. But that is merely how you see it. By so naming things and describing them, you are only inventing your own terms about them. And just as speech is invention about objects and ideas, so myth is invention about truth. We have come from God, continued Tolkien, and inevitably the myths wounded by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light, the eternal truth that is with God. Indeed, only by myth-making, only by becoming a sub-creator and inventing stories, can man aspire to the state of perfection that he knew before the fall. Our myths may be misguided, but they steer however shakily towards the true harbor, while materialistic progress leads only to a yawning abyss and the iron crown of the power of evil. In expounding this belief in the inherent truth of mythology, Tolkien had laid bare the center of his philosophy as a writer, the creed that is at the heart of the Silmarillion. Lewis listened as Dyson affirmed in his own way what Tolkien had said. You mean, asked Lewis, that the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth that works on us in the same way as the others, but a myth that really happened? In that case, he said, I begin to understand. At last, the wind drove them inside, and they talked in in Lewis's rooms until 3 a.m. when Tolkien went home. After seeing him out into the high street, Lewis, Lewis and Dyson walked up and down the cloister of new buildings, still talking until the sky grew light. Twelve days later, Lewis wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves, I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ, in Christianity. I will try to explain this another time. My long night talk with Dyson and Tolkien had a great deal to do with it. Meanwhile, Tolkien, in, in, in vigilating in the examination schools, was composing a long poem recording what he had said to Lewis. He called it Mythopoeia, the making of myths, and he wrote in his diary, Friendship with Lewis compensates for much, and besides giving constant pleasure and comfort, has done me much good from the contact with a man at once honest, brave, intellectual, a scholar, a poet, and a philosopher, and a lover, at least after a long pilgrimage of our Lord." That's just an amazing passage, an amazing backstory. So beautiful to kind of set the stage for what this poem actually represents. It, it's not a poem that exists in a um, in a vacuum. Uh, it, it has a very specific and, and even mythological in the sense of true myth quality of its own. Right? It, it kind of has. If, if um, the more you dive into these both Lewis and Tolkien's lives, their biographies this story has a kind of a legendary quality to it. It's that night, right? That they had that fateful discussion. Um, so thanks for entertaining me while I read that re- rather long passage for bearing with me. I thought it was, I thought it was too good to pass up as we're talking about this particular topic. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> so David, now that you've read Mythopoeia, what do you make of it as a C.S. Lewis amateur, as someone who has uh, spent a good amount of your last several years, um, Diving in and, and seeking to more deeply understand C.S. Lewis, uh, what do you make of Mythopoeia? So, first of all, a little bit of background. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only, prior to this, the only works of Tolkien that I'd read were The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and Leaf by Nigel. Okay. And I'm currently working through The Silmarillion. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I enjoy poetry, but my exposure is still reasonably limited. Sure. So, with that as the background, uh, the first time I was going through Mythopoeia, I got the gist of what. Tolkien was arguing, mm-hmm. but 
uh, much like till we have faces i had to go back and read it slowly sure. mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and try, re- multiple times and really try and understand the details of what he's talking about and i actually went looking for a little bit of commentary mm-hmm. and i didn't find much and uh i was organizing holly ordway she's going to be coming on our show next season and uh, i when i was talking to her organizing that i said do you know of any commentaries on this and she said that it's one of Tolkien's best works and that's sorely overlooked. Mm-hmm. And she told me that mm-hmm. in her upcoming book, she's going to be devoting much more time to it. So it's like, great, but that doesn't help me out now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the one piece of advice I did see around that I think was definitely helpful was people said often read this with on fairy stories, mm-hmm. uh, mm. which Tolkien wrote later. They said that the two really go together as well as really Leaf by Niggle, which I'd already read. Yes. The main thing that puzzled me about the poem was if I didn't know the date of the poem, if I didn't know the background, because I know that story because of Lewis's side of it. Sure. uh, If I didn't know that story and I just read the poem, I would have thought that it was written to someone who was a strict materialist Mm. and an atheist, someone who actually denies that Mm. in God and the supernatural. Uh, But the thing is, I know the historical context that Lewis at this point was a theist. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... Part of part of me couldn't help but feel: Is this entirely fair? Mm. That what he's arguing against isn't this a little bit of a straw man? Because this isn't really Lewis's position. Yeah, and I mean, even the dedication of the poem doesn't seem entirely fair to the one who said that myths were lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver. So, so you were thinking to yourself: Distinguo, Tollers, dist- distinguo. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And and even it's addressed, you know, from Philomethus to Misomethus, mm-hmm. from the myth lover to the myth hater. Yeah. Lewis didn't hate myths. Um, even if he thought that they were lies breathed through silver, he still loved them. And they were the very foundation of his relationship with his friend Arthur Greaves, who has been mentioned. And that was the main thing that I spent a lot of my time wrestling with. Hmm. And I sort of came up with two suggestions as to what Tolkien might be doing here. The first is perhaps he is just using this discussion as a as as an input to, for a broader argument mm. against a position that is e- even wider than Lewis's, um, and the other thought that I had was that maybe Tolkien is actually speaking about Lewis here, in so far as he is he's criticizing Lewis for not following through on his worldview. Mm. That although at this point in his life he has become a theist, his thinking is still very materialistic. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II, he would often talk about many people, many Christians being practical atheists mm. insofar as that they would confess something, they would intellectually assent to something, but in their day-to-day life, they kind of lived indistinguishably yeah. from atheists. Sure. Interesting. So, um, yeah, you know, that is a that is a really great point. I mean, it, and it's not something necessarily that I picked up on. And it's interesting to think about why that might be because – part of me thinks that maybe, maybe told, you know, maybe Tolkien, um, a, a, another possible explanation is that Tolkien was trying to, um, paint a picture of not just this particular conversation, but also of a kind of a larger, maybe a larger trajectory, right? On it, It's like a manifesto for his point of view. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the belief in myth and the, the, the main antagonist against that is, the materialist is the the reductionist, the person who always believes in progress and mm-hmm. who is the chronological snob. So it's almost like he steel mans his 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 opponent to his strongest, most extreme position, and then starts taking it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The um, I mean, I'm trying to think about that word. It's interesting what you said about because the for those who don't have it in front of them, the dedication of of Mythopoeia um, is or not the dedication, but it's Phil, Philomethus to Mizomethus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you think like lover of myth versus hater of myth. I I suppose Mizomethus could be also, it's it's tough to question Tolkien because he was, uh, you know, when it comes to words, his use of words, because he'd usually be like, I meant what I said. Um, (laughs) But but perhaps the meaning there is more along the lines of someone who just has a a more negative view of, of some, maybe a more pessimistic view or uh, something, not necessarily a hater of it, but like kind of a more pessimistic view and of it. And doesn't fully appreciate what it is. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. So for example, someone might say, oh, I hate my car. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, in a sense, because you're not appreciating the fact that you don't have to walk everywhere. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and, right. And, and of course, if, if myths are, it, as Lewis said, like lies breathe through silver, like that is a, like 
the, the through silver part is kind of a, you know, it's a nice thing to say, but the, to call them lies, I mean, that's, um, that's a very like blunt, uh, not particularly favorable thing to say about a particular genre. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's one possible explanation. Um, what did any, um, did anything uh, you talked about, you needed, you kind of needed to work through, um, uh, some commentaries and finds a different, you know, kind of different, uh, takes on what's, what they're trying to say and what Tolkien is trying to say in the poem. Were there any like claims or anything that, uh, that tripped you up along the way, like at particular lines that tripped you up? I had to go to my dictionary quite a few times yeah. to mm-hmm. discover <laughs> the meaning beside some of the words. Yeah. 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 There's Same. a, there's a few of those in there for sure. Um, I know the, uh, let's see here. Which one was it? Limning was one I had to look up. L- Limning, definitely. Um, or, Origo. Or, Origo. Yeah, I was just about to say Origo. Um, yeah, t- Tolkien, Tolkien showing off his, uh, uh, his uh, lexicon, is that the right word? Yeah, his, uh, yes. his vast vocabulary. <laughs> um, so, Involuted, munition. Oh my goodness, yeah. There, there, were, there were quite a few I had to go and look up. So we know that Tolkien and Lewis spent a lot of time exchanging and critiquing each other's ideas over the years. Can you see any major ideas of Lewis's reflected in the work? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'd say that was actually probably one of my most consistent experiences reading through Mythopoeia. Uh, I'd read a line and it would put me in mind of something that Lewis had written. Um, and the interplay between the two authors over the course of their career, uh, Diana Glyer, Again, Bandersnatch, it, it really unpacks how the two influence one another. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, I'm reading The Silmarillion at the moment. Mm-hmm. And when I read Ina Lindeley, all I could think of was The Magician's Nephew. Mm-hmm. And as I'm singing Narnia into being, I was like, hmm, this sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> um, but with regards to Mythopoeia, I, I would come across entire stanzas, lines, sometimes even just like a word or a phrase that would put me in mind of something that Lewis wrote. And they, they cluster around a few areas, but particularly the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tolkien begins, you look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace, one of the many minor globes of space. A star's a star, some matter in a ball, compelled by courses mathematical, amid the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are each moment slain. So I was reading that. I got Tolkien's main point that he is presenting his opponent's modern worldview, seeing yeah. the cosmos as predictable, determined, cold, dark, meaningless. And this is very much against his own. It's much more akin to Chesterton, whom they both loved. Mm-hmm. Chesterton said that the world will never starve of wonders, but only for want of wonder, basically mm. how people will see the world. And Tolkien is criticizing materialism as a worldview because it's blind to transcendence. It just sees the world as an endless chain of cause and effect. Mm-hmm. And throughout this entire poem, he's arguing you can't just reduce it to this. And one thing that was that was funny, I didn't realize until I read this and it it made me dig into a little bit more about Addison's walk where they were walking. Yeah. Joseph Addison, he actually wrote a hymn called The Spacious Firmament on High. Oh, interesting. He's mm-hmm. arguing for the biblical point of view from Lewis's favorite psalm, Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes, yeah. That the entire world points to something beyond itself. And so as I read that, that first part of that first stanza, it reminded me of several different things from different parts of Lewis's corpus. The first was from the Ransom Trilogy. And for people that aren't familiar, Lewis wrote a science fiction trilogy because he and Tollers were sitting down and he said, there's nothing else for it, Tollers. You and I, there isn't enough of the stuff that we like to read out there, so we're just going to have to write it ourselves. (laughs) And so they tossed a coin and it was agreed that Lewis would write a story about space travel and Tolkien would write a story about time travel. Tolkien, in his usual fashion, procrastinated and it didn't really come to much, although it was probably the seeds for... Uh, part of his legendarium sure but lewis who was a little bit more let's get this done kind of attitude he wrote the ransom trilogy uh, and it's a it's a science fiction trilogy and in the first book of the series out of the silent planet the protagonist travels from earth to mars and as he's traveling he realizes that he hadn't understood space up until that point he had been like the person in Mythopoeia, Mm -hmm. who saw it as, as this cold dark and inane in 
Out of the Silent Planet, he writes, Professor Ransom had read of space. At the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black, cold vacuity, the utter deadness, which seemed to supposed, which was supposed to separate the worlds. Now that very name space seemed a blasphemous liable for this Afrian, which is heavenly, this Afrian ocean of radiance in which they swarm. So his very character is the one who realizes his own fault. Yeah. And mm. the funny thing is, is Professor Ransom is based on Tolkien. Yes. Yeah. He's a philologist. Huh. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah. I, I actually never heard it called the Ransom Trilogy before, but uh, uh, but I knew exactly what you were talking about when you said that. Yeah. A lot of people call it the Space Trilogy, mm -hmm. and diehard Lewis people correct, no, 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 no. It's not about space for this very reason. Yeah. But it's not empty and vacuous. It's full of life. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Now, the other... The other uh, now, the other part of Lewis's work that this made me think of was from The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Mm -hmm. Because in that book, Lewis comes to recognize how inadequate it is to have a reductionist description of what a star is. Remember in Mythopoeia, mm -hmm. it says a star is a star, played mm -hmm. in a ball of gas. Well, in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the children, the Pevensies, they actually get to meet a star, a star right, at rest. Yeah. And Eustace says, well, in our world, a star is a flaming ball of gas. And the response he gets is, even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is. Mm. It is only what it is made of. Hmm. Interesting. Very cool. Very nice. So, um, uh, let's see. So, can you see kind of reversing, you know, turning the tables? Um, can you see any notes of Lewis's influence within this on uh, on Tolkien? And it may be hard to distinguish because you know, there was so much interplay between the two of them, but is there anything you'd say that like Tolkien got this from, you know, from Lewis? I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> because I think this is still a little bit too early in Lewis's career. He's okay. only mm -hmm. come to theism. He hasn't fully embraced the, the mythic imagination and all of the consequences of it. Mm. Um, it. The influence here, I think, at least at this stage, goes mostly in one way. Later in his life, Lewis is going to be the main sounding board for The Lord of the Rings and is going to have a lot to say. Sure. In fact, when uh, when Tolkien first gave Lewis a short version, an early draft of Baron and Luthien, uh, Lewis went home, read it that night, scrolled a little note saying, wonderful, I would have enjoyed it just as much if I didn't know who the author was, haven't spent a pleasanter evening in ages. Mm. Uh, notes will follow. And... I think it's about two weeks later, he sends him a letter. It's like 15 pages with notes, corrections, things he should change, and he even rewritten vast stanzas of it as to what he thought would be better. Mm -hmm. So the influence, I think, definitely comes back the other way, but that's, that's mm -hmm. later in his career. I think gotcha. here, what when Tolkien is sharing the mythic vision, mm -hmm. this is going to be a, a, a significant catalyst in Lewis's own thinking and also how he how he will later um, write his own works. Because Tolkien's point here is that myth con conveys truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lewis himself would later write that when he was writing the Chronicles of Narnia, he was writing them in such a way that uh, they could get past people's watchful dragons. Mm -hmm. That they might be on their guard yeah. against uh, images of Christ and the church and all, right. all of these things that have Sunday school associations and, and stained glass images. But by cloaking that in a myth, he can communicate the ideas of Christianity, uh, give people an insight into the Christian worldview, because it's wrapped in a myth, but is communicating the deeper truth in the same mm -hmm. way that uh, Tolkien's mythology is basically compatible with his Catholicism, with his Christianity, mm -hmm. insofar as it's still monotheistic, but he somehow manages to integrate the pagan gods to enjoy the story yeah. and, uh, and uh, just have fun with it. That, and, but still convey that truth at the at the heart of it. I think that you know, and that's interesting. Um, just on a side note, that particular integration of the pagan of the pagan gods um, into, I mean, for both Lewis and Tolkien, did that in a in a certain way in their fictional works. And um, I, we could dis distinguo between the ways in which they did it, but uh, the, nevertheless, they both did something like that. And that actually can be that can be a little scandalizing to some Christians actually in the fact that you know they they aren't they actually kind of admit these these lesser deities into um you know into the into their universes into their fictional universes 
but um, it, it's very integral to their mode of thought. Earlier, yeah. I spoke about the four loves and about the danger when we take natural loves and elevate them too high. They become demons. Mm-hmm. They need to be mm-hmm. rightly ordered. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's it's very similar with regards to our, our love of paganism and these stories. If if they're taken, if they take the place of God, that's bad. Yeah. But when when the true God is in His rightful place at the top, then you can enjoy these things for what they are. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and and one that uh, you can definitely see them. That's a very uh, it seems to be a very unique thing that they shared, right? And a unique quality of of, of how they saw the world. Um, I got I was a quick yeah. quick question here, um, just to kind of about where where Mythopoeia kind of occurs within the legendarium of Tolkien and Lewis. So I know you you mentioned that it predates. It was actually written before The Hobbit before Tolkien wrote right, The yeah. Hobbit. Um, and was it also written very much before Lewis had kind of gotten traction with his works as yeah. well? So mm-hmm. it, did it predate everything that Lewis Basically. wrote? Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, in a lot of ways... Primordial myth. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Okay. It, and, and that... A great question, because I mean, I, feel, I think that... I think that's why, uh, even though it's a lesser known of Tolkien's works... It is such an important one because it captures a pivotal moment, I think, in both of their lives. A, pi- a pivotal, uh, it, it, on, on one hand, it captures for Lewis a critical conversation that led him to become a Christian, which obviously changed his life and mm-hmm. set, like, set him on a trajectory to accomplish all the things that he accomplished um, and to be known for them. For Tolkien, um, I think it... It, it helped him clarify a lot of his own thoughts, right? So you can see this kind of iron sharpening iron thing going on here, right? Uh, this friendship. Absolutely. This I, was friend- just, I was just about to say yeah. that one thing. It's like, actually, now I think of it, the influence of Lewis was simply being the sounding board that allowed Tolkien to revise his own ideas in the same way that we see fairy stories starting to influence the transition from The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Tolkien is now being forced to articulate and think out his own position. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I was actually, I was very surprised because I, I didn't read any background before I reread this poem. And you mentioned we, we talked about Mythopoeia before, mm-hmm. we, like it was very early on A in the podcast, ago, yeah. like before I had even like reread The Hobbit or the even read The Silmarillion or whatever. And so I was actually really surprised when you said this predates The Hobbit, because as I was reading the poem again this morning, I was like, I wish I had read this before. I read Lord of the Rings because it helped me understand Lord of the Rings. I mean, he mentions elves and he mentions dragons and he mentions a shadow. And I'm like, how? I I just assumed that this kind of came out of the writing of the Lord of the Rings. So it's, I guess, I don't, it just kind of blew my mind that, that, you know, that this came before, I guess. So many, so many of the themes are here. I think, I think actually for both of them in, in seed form, right? Like it's almost like this is a, Although Tolkien wrote it, like it feels like it's kind of a creative manifesto of sorts for both of them, you know. It's definitely the beginning, beginning of that, and what the Inklings would ultimately stand for. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you see them pushing back against things like modernism, progressivism, yeah, the, the, the whole myth of progress. I mean, anyone who's read Lewis's works knows he comes back to this again and again. This ridiculous notion that just because something's newer, it's better; because it's mm-hmm. older, it's worse. The idea that we can, you know, we're we're becoming better and better all of the time. Look at the wonders of technology, mm-hmm. right? And this mm-hmm. was the generation that went through two wars of unspeakable destruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's that. Um, that reminded me of the line towards the end where Tolkien says, um, uh, "What it's uh, has to do with progress." Where is it? Oh, yeah. Um, Before. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient. Before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends. If by God's mercy, progress ever ends. Mm. And does, like, I just love that because Tolkien was so, he was so pessimistic about the idea of like technological, um, technological progress that technology actually led to any kind of progress in a moral sense you know, for mm-hmm. the, you know, for the human race. And uh, I don't know, here we are, here we are uh, using using zoom to podcast over a, a long, long distance here to have a conversation over a long distance. So there's, there's obviously some good things about technological progress, but, um, but yeah, I mean, they, and they were both, they both were like, hold on, don't be so quick to leave the past behind, <laughs> like to leave the past behind though. Right. Like we've lost it's, a lot. It's one, of, 
is one of the things that Screwtape says in the Screwtape letters. So this demon is, is writing to his nephew saying that when you're tempting someone, make sure that they stay away from old books or if they read them, the one question they must never ask is, is it true? They want right. to be talking about influences and background and word choice and all of this other stuff. At no point let them actually look at old books and ask, is this communicating truth? Mm. And uh, when it comes to progress, Lewis, I... I could almost say, I think he says this in every single book. He says something to the effect of progress is making sure that you, you're heading in the right direction. Yes. If yeah. you take the wrong turning, progress doesn't mean going forward. It means going back to where you made a mistake, fixing it, and then carrying on. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a point I've, I've heard before. It might have been the Lewis who I first heard it from and uh, such a such an outstanding an outstanding point. Um one that in and of itself is kind of a good a good little examination of conscience on a regular <laughs> basis, right? Um, go ahead. One, one of the one of the bits in the poem that I particularly liked because I'm relatively new to a lot of Tolkien stuff. Sure, I, I thought subcreation here was explained beautifully. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it describes God as this pure light and that we are refracted light. So we are a prism. So if you just put a prism in a dark room, it's not going to do anything. But if you shine light through it that prism will reveal part of that light. Mm. And this is what we are ultimately called to do. And I was thinking, how does Lewis deal with subcreation? And I came up with a few suggestions, but I think the main one is that, it, particularly in, say, in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan uses the children. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need to use the children. In the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, they're looking for lords. Aslan could just you know, bring them back to Narnia himself, but he doesn't do that. He sends Caspian. He then sends the children to help. It's the same with Prince Caspian when he's lost his throne. Aslan could just turn up and fix it. Right. But he doesn't do that. He, he allows them to participate in his own redemption. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I mean, that's just one... That is one insight that I have found that obviously I, I, I find uh, big time in Tolkien, but I can see that in Lewis as well. And I think it's, I think it's a very helpful insight into, um, into a better, uh, more robust and meaningful form of Christianity, right? Like practice of Christianity and understanding that, um, that like our creative endeavors are, uh, our desires and the work that we do with our hands are part of God creating us, right? Like, like into the the fullness of what He intended us to be, right? Yeah, in Anu Lindale, you have that image of the world being kind of there, put there, and they, the the Valar who enter the world and the Maiar have this vision of what it's supposed to be, but it's dim, and they each have a part that they see in it but they have to work to develop it. And that theme continues, you know, throughout. And when he talks about looking back on the elves, um, I, I found that fascinating. And, and again, this is early on, you know, is his, his middle earth mythology is not particularly fully developed there, but uh, he says great powers. They slowly brought out of themselves and looking backward, they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in their, in the mind and light and dark on secret looms entwined. And just that idea of like looking back into, uh, you know, into the world and the things of the past and finding like this kind of elvish, wisdom right a, a deeper maybe more patient wisdom and insight into the nature of things mm -hmm. to build upon yeah and i think he's also pointing to the commonalities you see among those mythologies when they when these mythologies look out at the world they see a fairly consistent meaning in things mm -hmm. and that's an argument that lewis is going to pick up as an argument for christianity the similarities to mythologies that went before that's proof that's not disproof uh, and in Mere Christianity, he describes these uh, earlier mythologies as good dreams sent by God. Yeah. That, that, that they intuit something of reality uh, that even the limited pagan mind without revelation can begin to see. And then when Jesus Christ comes, it is the myth became fact. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, does Does this seem... So you actually already commented on this a little bit, but do you ask... Uh, do, let me ask the question. Does this seem to match with Lewis's own account of his conversion to theism and Christianity? So I, th I think you made the point that maybe he was already, you know, he was already a theist, which bi Carpenter's biography, you know, uh, agrees with that, right? That he was already a theist when they had this momentous conversation that night with Dyson present. Um, but do you feel like it, it overlaps pretty well with Lewis's account of his conversion to Christianity? Pretty much. I mean, yeah. Lewis actually gives us a relatively limited telling of his conversion. Anyone that's read Surprised by Joy, they're always surprised by the things that 
he leaves out. Mm. Uh, one of his friends said it shouldn't be called surprised by joy, it should be called suppressed by Jack. Uh, <laughs> so he, he skips over a lot of a lot of the details uh, in in his spiritual autobiography, but we get a little bit more in his letters. And uh, he wrote to Arthur Greaves. We've mentioned him a few times. He was his childhood friend back in Ireland. And the two of them, there is an enormous correspondence between them. They they wrote to each other for 50 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I delete text messages that are over 30 days old. So <laughs> um, I'm very different. But he outlines pretty much telling us what the Carmen book said. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the fundamental thing that Tolkien managed to uh, to to, to do in Lewis was to clear away some of his prejudice mm-hmm. that he came very open to the pagan myths as soon as Christianity as soon as there were truth claims attached to it he got very very resistant and he helped Lewis see his own prejudice that he brought to those stories and also gave him a framework through which to understand Christianity uh, I, I pulled up the letter uh, in anticipation and in the latter part he says Now, the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference, that it really happened. Mm. And one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that it is God's myth where the other might, whether, remembering that it is God's myths, whereas the others are men's myths, i.e. the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets using such images as he found there. While Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things. Therefore, it is true, not in the sense of being a description of God that no finite mind can take in, but in the sense that of being the way in which God chooses to or can appear to our faculties. The doctrines we get out of the true myth are, of course, less true. They are translations into our concepts and ideas, that which God has already expressed in a language more adequate, namely the actual incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection. Basically, God has been communicating through real physical acts through history. Yes. And he says, does this amount to belief in Christianity? Because this is, this is still fairly early on. This is in October of 31. He says, at any rate, I'm now certain, A, that this Christian story is to be approached in a sense as I approach the other myths, and B, that it most, and B, that it is the most important and full of meaning. <laughs> say that again. And B, that it is the most important and full of meaning. I am almost nearly certain that it really happened. Wow. Huh. And it, and so it, he cleared away the cleared away the debris and allowed mm-hmm. Lewis to actually come at the gospel afresh. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, and and we see that same idea, of course, uh, at the end of On Fairy Stories with for Tolkien and um, speaking about um, uh, Christianity being the story, right? That actually happened, right? Like the the myth that actually happened, the resurrection being. And he's speaking about you catastrophe, really, right? Um, the the Res- the incarnation is the eucatastrophe of human history, and um, the resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the incarnation. Right. So casting, um, casting this all of history really as the story, right? The myth that we inhabit, right? If mm-hmm. you will. Um, great. So, um, do you think having read, having now read Mythopoeia, will it serve to illuminate your own understanding of Lewis? I think I can now see more clearly how there was this cauldron of ideas bubbling in which which Lewis started drawing from as he began to convert. This is I, I'm getting a better sense of kind of the the waters he was swimming in, yeah, mm. and seeing how he took some of these ideas, some of them he really ran with, yeah, um, and you get a little bit of a better sense of the sort of things that the Inklings would have been talking about when they gathered at the Eagle and Child for a pint. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, to have been a fly on the wall, on the wall there, you know. <laughs> you know, it's it's really it's quite remarkable to me um have you know having read even just a few of the Narnia books and then the other things I've read by Lewis that he was ever not a Christian. I yeah. mean, it just it's it's re- it's just kind of blows my mind because yeah. it, it just seems like he just you know, once he made that conversion, he just he just went with it, you know, yeah. it was go big or go home. And wasn't it only a week that after this poem was written that he actually converted? I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, um, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very short. Some people dispute the timeline a little bit, okay. but yeah. whichever way you cut it, they had this conversation with Tolkien. That seemed to take out a big obstacle out of the way. Mm-hmm. And in Surprised by Joy, Lewis talks about his conversion as he was riding the sidecar 
with Warney. They were going to the zoo for the day. And he yes. says, all I know is when I set out, I didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God. When we arrived, I did. I did. Right, now, yes. Was that because Warney's driving was so terrifying? That <laughs> he needed the something. Fear of God to... into him? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's uh, funny. Yeah, it says in the biography, it says 12 days later. 12 right? days, yeah, okay. So when he was talking to Greece. But yeah, the timeline, I'm, I'm sure, in recollection, you know, these things, the way these things often happen, I mean, even looking back at my own conversion from Christianity, just from evangelicalism to uh, Catholicism, um, it's kind of a mess of events and different things that I realized. And I can't remember when I realized what, you know, and when I, you know, said this and, you know, had this conversation, but it all kind of, you try to reconstruct it and you do your best. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, but in, in, in my, in my own, in my own uh, conversion, I had something very similar and I had shared my testimony quite a few times and I got to a point where I was like, I'm not sure if that bit was true. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately I had all of the, uh, all of the sheets that we had had at our prayer meetings. I hadn't thrown any of them away. And so I actually got to go and look through because the, the big thing for me was reading the opening to Jeremiah where it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Mm -hmm. I said, your part, I appoint you as prophet of the nations. That was, that was my big turnaround. And I actually found the sheet of paper that wow. I was reading with that little passage in it. Oh. So yeah, uh, human memory is, is, is definitely an interesting thing, but it's occasionally nice when it actually gets validated. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. This so is true. true. This is true. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, kind of a final one, two punch on Mythopoeia. Um, what struck you most about Mythopoeia on a personal level? And did you have a favorite line um, or a favorite passage in Mythopoeia? I think I'm from, well, uh, the main things that struck me were uh, uh, Tolkien's feistiness when it came to fighting against the myth of progress. You know, it's like, oh, if God will ever save us from all of this continued mm. progress. Right. Mm. Uh, I love that bit. I also loved his... Um, I'm going to call it Declaration of Independence since we're in July and I'm living in America. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's independence from this reductionist materialistic view when he says, I will not walk with your, with mm -hmm. your sapient mm -hmm. apes. Mm -hmm. When he's basically saying, I've looked at your worldview, I find it incredibly wanting, and I'm just declaring to you now, that's not me. I, I, I want to be the people that are building the ships. I want to be with the poets. I want to be with the people who are looking beyond the confines of the prison cell that you want to put me in mm -hmm. because I, 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 I see daylight coming in from outside. and I know, I know that there is a world out there that goes far beyond these prison walls. And it, it's, if you've read The Silver Chair, this is basically what Paul Glum says. I'm going to live like a Narnian, even if Narnia doesn't exist, but because this is not a way to live. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, that's such a, that's such a great line. Um, I was going to say it reminds me of uh, like that part in the baptismal vows where you um, uh, in the baptis baptismal promises where we say um, I reject Satan and all his empty promises. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> like just I, I like, you know, you say like basically the Apostles Creed before that or like the first half of the Apostles Creed before that. And you say, you know, yes, I believe this. And then it's like. And do you reject Satan and all of his empty promises? And, you know, and you're just like, yes. Right. And, that, and there's something that feels just so like invigorating and powerful about that. You know, you're just mm -hmm. like, yeah, forget all that stuff. Right. Like just throw that. That's all garbage. I'm done with that. You know? Well, and and in, in, in that right, it talks about his lies and his empty promises. And that is what Tolkien has been refuting in this mm -hmm. poem. Right. The lies of, of modernism, the mm -hmm. lies that all oh, things are just going to get better and better. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the lie that we are nothing and insignificant and nothing ever really has any kind of meaning and there's no transcendence. Tolkien is saying, no, I reject this and all of its evil lies and works. Right, yeah. right. And then he raises you one and says... You know, it forces you to look at things on a much deeper level, you know, to, to not like just not to see a star in this, not to see a, just a flaming ball of gas when you see a star or mm -hmm. not to just see a tree when you see, you know, leaves hanging on on boughs, but to really look at them with through the creator's lens. That recovered vision. Right. Is, exactly. Know, like the Tolkien talks about it on fairy stories. Yes. And, uh, what, and you were alluding to with um, the Ransom trilogy and the, you know, the different, different view of space, right? Seeing things not as, what does he say? Not as you see, not, not merely as what they are, but as what they are meant Made to of. be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's I, that idea. Find, and you find that idea again and again in The Magician's Nephew, Lewis mm -hmm. says, what yeah. you see 
depends very much on where you're standing and the kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. yep. And he has this wonderful essay called Meditation in a Tool Shed, where he sees this shaft of light coming into the shed. And he says, there are two ways of looking at it. You can actually look at the beam of light. You see the little dust, you see the tool shed illuminated. He says, but you can also go and stand in that beam of light and look back on a, 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 along it. You look along yeah. rather than looking at. Mm. And when you do that, you see the blue sky and miles and miles away, you see the sun itself. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's a uh, recovered is as it was meant to be seen, right? Like mm. as you know, and, uh, and that's just so that can be the difference between night and day in your own life. Um, in such a, such a huge way. Yeah. Well, David, this has been amazing. This has been so wonderful. Yes, um, it has. thank yeah. you so much for, um, allowing us to turn the tables on you and, and come onto the podcast. And how the turntables have turned. How the turntables have turned. <laughs> um, so where can listeners learn more about Pints with Jack? Well, they can find us on Twitter and Instagram. We are at Pints with Jack. Uh, we are also uh, on the World Wide Web. Our website is pintswithjack.com and you can find the podcast everywhere. There are good podcasts and bad and we also have a YouTube channel where we put the audio up as well as uh, short little videos. Uh, we call them Skype sessions where we're talking, digging into a particular idea. And also Matt and I, we did a an introduction to Lewis effectively. Uh, we did a mini series, 12 episodes that we sat down and it's got lots of nice production value. And it was just to introduce people to the thought of C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. so they could watch the series and then they could say, dig into mere Christianity and go a little bit deeper. Because yeah. that's that's what we've wanted to do in all of this. We, we ultimately want people to read the books. Mm -hmm. uh, all we're trying to do is get people across the threshold mm -hmm. uh, so that they can go further up and further in with the actual man himself and his actual works. Yeah. Very much in parallel with uh, what we're trying to do. Here yeah. With I was going to say that sounds kind so. of familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, any final things you really want people to know about CS Lewis? Uh, just final word kind of things or, um, and do you have a final pitch for why the world needs more Jack? Um, what do people need to know about Lewis? One fun little fact I discovered when I was reading a biography recently is that I, I, I looked at what was written and I worked out that Lewis probably smoked about 60 cigarettes a day. Um, uh, which when I sat and did, did the math, that basically meant he spent a third of his waking life with a cigarette in his mouth. And actually when I visited his home in Oxford, it's called the Kilns, they said that they had painted the walls, but they hadn't painted the ceiling. And you look up and you see it just stained with nicotine. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> but uh, what do people need to know about Lewis? Oh, he was an atheist. He was a theist, Christian, war veteran. He addressed the nation uh, during World War II. Mm. Um, he was an author that wrote in basically every genre that was out there. I, I mean, just that alone. This is an interesting guy that is worth taking a look at. Most definitely. Uh, and, and, and he was also very prophetic about modern society. You mm. read Lewis and you would think he was writing today. He wasn't. Amen. He was writing in the so 30s true. and 40s. Yep. And he, he could not only see things at the, at the macro level, uh, at, at the societal level, he could see the direction society was heading in and he didn't think it was good. Mm. Um, but I would say he was given it real insight at the micro level as well, at the, at the level of the human soul. Uh, and I think it was what you were talking about earlier, Greta, he was a thoroughly converted man. Mm -hmm. He didn't just, he didn't just respond uh, with a, you know, the church lady. Oh, well, that's nice. You know, he, <laughs> right. he, he, he wasn't going to reduce Christianity to just mere platitudes. When Christ said that you need to forgive your enemies and you need to love them, he took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. And speaking for myself, when I read his works, it, it challenges me. It makes me feel uncomfortable, which yes. I think is what any any good book or homily or sermon should really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think in all of that, he has a lot to speak to our current climate. The world is very strange at the moment. Mm -hmm. And Lewis asks us to take what Christ says seriously. Mm -hmm. And he asks us to you know, seek for holiness and our souls, first of all. There's, 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 a, there's a passage in Mere Christianity where Lewis says, um, Suppose that you hear a story of some terrible atrocities and, and, and you're, you're just shocked. He says, when you find out that that's not entirely true, that the, that the report was incomplete or it, it was inaccurate, is your first response, oh, thank God, that you know, even those people aren't as bad as that? Is that our response? Or are we a little bit upset that you know, mm -hmm. our political or cultural opponents, uh, you know, they don't, they're not shown in as bad as light as we would like? 
Lewis gives us warning. He says that, you know, if, if we give that idea its head, soon we'll see everything with a, with a, through a black lens. We'll see everything mm -hmm. that'll be a little darker and we'll basically, our entire outlook for ourselves, our neighbor, the entire universe will be just a universe of pure hatred. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, that is a really powerful parting thought and one that is mm -hmm. so pertinent to, you know, um, the world we live in right now at this moment. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just thank, thank you for, for sharing that final thought with us. Yeah. Well, I actually had one more thought. Oh, one more. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Penultimate thought, yeah. Yes. Because I wrote you guys a haiku. <gasps> oh, yes. Yay! <laughs> so this was inspired by Mythopoeia. Deeper facts unveiled through myth-making and legend. Truth breathed through silver. Ooh. Nice. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> Nicely that so done. Cool. Well, yes. thank you, David. Thank you so much for coming on uh, on the podcast. We we thoroughly enjoyed this time, oh, and wow. uh, we definitely need to do this again. Um, I'm so, down. Uh, awesome. Sweet. Well, um, yeah. Thanks again, and um, and we appreciate you very much. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Tolkien Road. On our next episode, we'll begin our deep dive into the history of the Third Age, that history that precedes the great years of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. That's like 3,000 years of history, so there's a lot to examine there. Special thanks to our patrons. You guys rock, especially our $5 or more patrons. Daniel P., David B., Chuck F., Ish of the Hammer, Chris L., James L., Zeke F., James A., Emilio P., Shannon S., Teresa C., Asia V., Brian O, Robert B, Eric S, and Joey S. Thank you all so much, and thanks to all who listen. We'll talk at you next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks to John and Greta for inviting me on the show. In the next episode, Matt is going to be interviewing Douglas Gresham, C.S. Lewis's stepson. So if you'll join us next time, we'll keep going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.